and welcome back. We're looking at the second part of our soil chemistry talk. In this uh, situation, in this case, we're looking at specifically the fertility part of soil chemistry. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't already, you need to make sure that you've looked at so the the talk that concerns soil pH and cation exchange capacity. That was the that is meant to have been the previous talk. Soil fertility won't make much sense unless you go through those two. Today what we're going to do is look at soil fertility. And um, soil fertility looks at, number one, the essential plant nutrients. We'll look a little bit more deeply at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We'll look at liming and acidifying, and then look at soil fertility recommendations. I'm going to emphasize here again <clears throat> that soil fertility and the notion of soil fertility as most um, land-grant university uh, folks that recommend soil fertility, they look at it from a standpoint that it largely ignores soil biology. It's not that this chemistry is not valid, but it does ignore soil biology and it works uh, especially in situations where you've got a lot of annual agriculture and you've got very, very low um, soil uh, organic matter. So I, I wanted to emphasize that that's the case. When we start looking at soil biology, we'll start looking at other processes, natural processes that take place that really, um, if we look after those processes, that will actually obviate the need for a lot of inputs or uh, eliminate the need for so many inputs. So let's go ahead have a look at soil fertility. Um, this is a weird looking creature but it's basically something called a high boy and they would apply nutrients something like nitrogen side dressing once the plant has grown and they would take a tissue test and look at how much nitrogen is in the soil. Again in a, an environment where soil organisms are kind of suppressed and not allowed to take their place. So here we're looking at essential plant nutrients, liming, and then fertility recommendations. What are those essential nutrients? Well, in general, we look at the macronutrients as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. So these are macronutrients or these are nutrients that are relatively, um, that need to be in relatively high amounts of supply. The micronutrients, things like boron, chlorine, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum and zinc should be there in lower quantities and often you don't want them in very high quanti quantities. You don't want a lot of copper or you don't want a lot of chlorine or chlor chlorides around in your soil but if they're not there you uh, you know your plant is going to suffer um, so let, let's go ahead and start talking firstly about uh, one of the first three and you'll notice also in this discussion that the carbon cycle or carbon in conventional fertility is completely ignored completely ignored but uh, let's go back. The chemistry is no, nonetheless valid, but let's look at it. So nitrogen really is uh, one of the most uh, um, important nutrients or, you know, it's, it's an abundant nutrient. If it's not around, well, you're going to see, uh, uh, put it this way, if there's not enough nitrogen around, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So nitrogen typically is going to give that green color to plants. Uh, we put nitrogen down, the plant grows like crazy. Um, it's really part of chlorophyll. The more nitrogen you have, well, nitrogen is part of protein. Um, yeah, nitrogen feeds soil mi mi microbes. Um, it, it does. But when we put commercial nitrogen down, it can suppress other soil microbes. But yes, uh, you put nitrogen down, and uh, it will actually uh, reduce the carbon to nitrogen co um, ratio in the soil and actually allow more mineralization of carbon to happen. <clears throat> the 
soil nitrogen that is available to plants uh, is in the forms of the ammonium ion, which is the NH4+, or the nitrate ion. The plant can absorb both of them, uh, uh, and uh, typically nitrates then are going to be uh, more dominant in the, the more moist, warm, well aerated soils. And of course they are highly leachable. Um, you'll find that these uh, species are not found in very, very high concentrations in nature. They're going to be found in soils that have been disturbed and they're also going to be found obviously in soils where you have high concentrations of inorganic or commercial fertilizer. So keep that in mind. You're not supposed to have 40 and 50 and 70 parts per million of nitrate in the soil. Typically and nitrates are going to be between 5 and 10 parts per million. Ammonium ions are going to be maybe between 4 and 6 parts per million. I'm, I'm kind of taking a wild stab there. But you're not going to find these very, very high concentrations unless you've got sort of some kind of disturbance. Um, a lack of nitrogen, number one, your plant's not going to grow. Number two, if you have an immediate lack of nitrogen, your plants are going to kind of be pale and a little bit greenish yellow. Um, and sometimes your lower leaves begin to fire, although that firing there is probably natural. Um, so you can see that. Um, <coughs> Basically, nitrates are natural in the soil, but in, in the occurrence of commercially applied nitrogen, your nitrate comes from your ammonium ion. Your ammonium ion is then acted upon by a nitrifying bacteria. And when nitrates are formed, remember that soils are negatively charged, and the nitrate will actually be repelled okay, it's going to be repelled by that soil particle, so it's going to move wherever the soil moisture is going to take it. So it's going to move down freely, and when nitrates go down the soil profile, especially if the source of those nitrates are the ammonium ion, they're going to drag calcium and magnesium out of the soil profile with them. So they, in, in a sense, you have man-made systems that are what we call leaky. They leak nitrates, they leak calcium and leak ma magnesium, leave hydrogen ions behind, and that's going to increase your soil pH. So a, um, a system that is leaky, that leaks a lot of nutrients, you will always be able to find, because your soil pHs are dropping, you're always going to have to have, uh, add lime to that. Sandy soils are, of course, most susceptible to leaching simply because uh, of that poor volume um, and it, it tends to allow that bulk movement of water through them. Okay, <clears throat> What's the problem with nitrate leaching? Number one, it, re 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 it represents a loss to the plot of nitrogen and a loss to the farmer. Um, and uh, what we find in commercial systems is that often no more than about 40% of the actual nitrogen that's applied in the form of fertilizer actually gets to the plant. The rest of it either goes up into the atmosphere by uh, denitrification or goes into the ground uh, by the way of leaching in the form of nitrate after nitrification. Now this can lead to certain problems. We've heard of a blue baby syndrome and we find that the nitrate concentrations if they go up more than about 10 milligrams per liter you're going to find problems with blue baby syndrome up in the Midwest. Um, we, we talk a little bit more about that in my aquatic sciences class. You'll also find that in nitrate or nitrogen limited uh, water bodies and that's mainly in places in, in uh, estuarine systems like the Chesapeake Bay, Bay Area or downtown, down in the Charleston or Morrell's Inlet area, you'll find that uh, it, it's a nitrate limiting situation, there's lots of phosphorus 
and that a flush of nitrogen into that system is actually going to increase the amount of um, algal mass uh, way above normal that is there. The algae are going to then outcompete uh, other macrophytic plants that are rooted in the, in the in the um, in a channel, uh, uh, and it'll also sometimes what'll happen is is that as the algae then blooms, grows, and then dies, it's going to settle to the bottom, and as it begins to decay, takes up a lot of oxygen and can cause anoxic situations. We find a lot of that. The worst case is the Gulf of Mexico with your dead zones. So that's the growth of uh, way much more algae than natural systems will allow. The algae then naturally die off, they sink to the bottom, they decay, they use up oxygen, literally suck out all the oxygen from the water table, and that means uh, aquatic creatures can't go there. So fish kind of move out because they're mobile, but other aquatic creatures like mo mollusks or um, even macro, well, mainly mollusks and, and things that can't move around that easily actually die. Benthic invertebrates would be another one of them. So there, there you find sources of nitrates in our groundwater. But the one on top there is the, the biggest one. Manuring in areas where you've got concentrated animal feeding operations is another one. There are ways to combat that through growing cover crops but we'll talk about that later. But nitrification leading to nitrates is going to lead to uh, that kind of leaching in the, into the groundwater. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of nitrogen fixation. Here, this treatment obviously does take into account natural systems. Many bacteria uh, can convert or fix atmospheric nitrogen to, uh, into the soil. So what it does is um, what these bacteria do, and the most common ones are the rhizobia bacteria that are associated with legumes. Um, rhizobia then live in symbiosis and you can see these great nodules. The sign of a good healthy rhizobium nodule will be that it has this really really pink color. So they live in community, if you like, with the plant's roots. Uh, uh, you know, you've got legumes, uh, soybeans, or any kind of bean, uh, peas, uh, vetches, clovers, lentils. Those will all, all be ry uh, rhizomes. Uh, these will then fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Remember, our atmosphere has 71%, uh, 79 percent of nitrogen. Those will fix nitrogen uh, and will essentially turn it into ammonium or nitrate nitrogen that passes on to the, um, to the plant. I'm not 100% what form it is, but it passes these nitri nitrates onto the plant. What, it, what do they get in exchange? They get sugars or polysaccharides in exchange. So they get energy from the plant because the plant's able to photosynthesize manufacture those sugars and plant, pass those sugars onto the rhizobia. The rhizobia in turn can do something which the plant can't do and that is fix nitrogen. Now in a soil that's been depleted of nitrogen, of uh, rhizobia, uh, you will find that you can actually inoculate rhizobia into the soil um, seeds, into the seeds at planting and you will find then your inoculated plants actually produce a lot more nitrogen. In this case, you can see high con higher concentrations of nitrogen. It's greener. Over here, there's a definite difference. So those rows were not inoculated. So inoculation in soils that are naturally depleted will actually benefit you some. <clears throat> Let's look at the nitrogen cycle in terms of... Um, nitrogen fixing bacteria this is a very very important part of nitrogen uh, natural nitrogen cycles so here we would have nitrogen again 79 percent of the earth's atmosphere there's abundant nitrogen the nitrogen fixing bacteria those little pink nodules on the roots will go ahead and 
form basically what we would say is ammonia okay when plants decay um, well let, let's let's leave it at that uh, when ammonia or when plants decay they will release nitrogen in the form first of all as ammonia your ammonifying bacteria will actually uh, yeah will actually convert those to the ammonium ion they would take it from the soil when you find ammonium ions in the soil uh, nitrifying bacteria will then use this ammonium ion as a form of energy like these guys will form the ammonia as a or use the ammonia as a form of energy they will then nitrify that combine the nitrogen the ammonium with oxygen to form nitrates uh, the nitrates then can also be taken up into the plant. Remember, nitrogen fixing bacteria can actually put the nitrogen straight into the plant. Okay, but um, nitrates can also be taken up into the plant and then will be converted to uh, ammonium there. Um, nitrates in the soil can also then be acted on by denitrif denitrifying bacteria. To convert it to atmospheric nitrogen and you would actually lose nitrogen this often happens in warm wet soils and you would lose your nitrogen to um, to the atmosphere by and large uh, excess concentrations of nitrate nitrates as we discussed previously will leach into the ground okay some common legume crops soybeans red clover alfalfa field peas I can also mention things like crimson clover, uh, if left to their own devices, will actually uh, convert, take atmospheric nitrogen and leave you, you know, up to 200, 250 pounds per acre of nitrogen. 250 pounds per acre of nitrogen will go, you, grow you a heck of a, a summer crop like corn. Okay, so let's just look at that nitrogen cycle. A little bit more closely because it's um, nitrogen has something like a seven oxidation states so you've got nitrogen in the plus five through to the ne minus negative three oxidation state which is quite amazing so plus five in the form of the nitrate ion uh, and m minus three in the form of the ammonium or ammonia ion um, so let's go back nitrogen in the atmosphere nitrogen gets fixed by plant uh, and becomes part of the plant or part of bacterial nitrogen so it's it's usually in what we might call uh, or that might be in the form of um, amino acids or proteins that are actually resident in the cytoplasm of the plants now animals uh, whether they're microbes or uh, macro macroorganisms will feed on the plants and convert that plant and uh, bacterial nitrogen to animal nitrogen let's think about it uh, a cow grazing clover for instance will do that but in the same way a little microorganism eating plant or bacterial anim uh, nitrogen will also convert it into animal nitrogen what does it what does it mean it ends up in the cytoplasm of the animal for example uh, a cow uh, has a lot of protein in it the protein then is made up of nitrogen that comes from the plants the animal uh, uh, let, let's before we carry on from the animal plants also actually die all right so they're not only eaten up by feeding but at the end of their life they might die and they might become detritus that nitrogen still resides in the detritus think about a, a dead leaf on the ground uh, leaves in the fall that might be on the ground or grass clippings or something there's a lot of nitrogen in there but it's in the form of detritus that nitrogen then will be broken down acted on by um, uh, arthropods for instance that will begin to um, to break the, the the large parts of that plant down but eventually microbes will also act on it 
and convert what was, say, a, a protein or an amino acid into ammonium, uh, into an ammonium ion. That's it there. Animals, as we said, will feed on those plant, uh, the, those plants, convert the plant and uh, nitrogen or the bacterial nitrogen to animal nitrogen, will excrete it in the form of ammonium, and that goes into the ground. This ion is fairly, uh, it is not very stable, um, so it, it can either be assimilated back up into the plant, the plant will, you know, it will go up into the plant roots quite easily, or even some bacteria will absorb it, okay? Or it is acted upon by the nitrification bacteria. So it will be, uh, be nitrified from N2O, NO2 minus to NO3, the nitrate, where it would also be absorbed by the plants. Finally, um, the denitrification process takes place in warm, wet soils, and this stuff will then go up into the atmosphere. So in um, annual agricultural systems where you apply commercial fertilizer about <clears throat> now this doesn't take into account a commercial fertilizer that comes in but that would come in as ammonium what we find is about uh, only about 45 40 percent of nitrogen actually ends up uh, in the plant the rest of it is actually ultimately lost to the environment so that's kind of a, a stunning figure, but I wanted to introduce you to that nitrogen cycle. It's very, very important, and we'll continue to, to look at that as we look at other critters. Remember, the nitrogen cycle doesn't occur on its own. It's going to occur in concert with the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the potassium cycle, and many other cycles that are associated with plants uh, and plant nutrients. Now, phosphorus is also an essential macronutrient. Um, it it functions uh, uh, to stimulate early plant root growth, root growth. It's associated mainly with the root. It uh, stimulates blooming. It hastens maturity. It's also part of the seed formation. Um, potassium, of course, is also part of seed and uh, uh, the, the seed and then also the fruit formation. Soil phosphorus um, is absorbed uh, in the form of some kind of soluble phosphate. We often call this um, uh, SRP, soluble reactive phosphorus. So it can be uh, in the form of dihydrogen phosphate or this hydrogen phosphate uh, form. Dihydrogen phosphate is going to be more prevalent over here. Hydrogen phosphate is going to be more, not prevalent, but absorbed more in higher pHs. Um, soil phosphorus is not very mobile, and what often happens with commercial phosphorus is it's applied, but it immediately gloms onto the soils. Um, remember, those soils are negatively charged, it'll glom on. And the negatively charged particles will hold it so tight that very little will actually release it. So we often find that only about 30% of the, the, the phosphorus that is applied uh, in the form of fertilizer actually ever makes it to the plant. The rest of it either accumulates in the soils or is uh, lost to the environment. Deficiency system you know, slowed growth, and then also you might find things like purplish leaves. And I think this might be specifically applying to the corn plant. Um, phosphorus fixation, uh, as we talked about, soils that have a lot of clay um, um, will actually then absorb this phosphorus onto them. But it gets to the point, especially with kaolinitic clays, which are one-on-one -on -one clays, um, they can only hold so much phosphorus. Once phosphorus gets to a point where it saturates those clay sites, it's going to leach out. But the other form of phosphorus loss is the loss of phosphorus 
through soil erosion. So whenever you have soil erosion, um, often the erosion is going to be of your finer particles and your organic particles. Well, that's where the phosphorus sits on the most, your finer particles being clays. Your phosphorus gets eroded out as well. So you have high phosphorus losses. So whenever you think of soil erosion uh, or sediment, uh, sedimentation, think of phosphorus loss as well. Um, the phosphorus is going to preferentially be moved out through that erosion process. In the USDA, they use the phosphorus in index in nutrient management, and the phosphorus index is going to take into account how much phosphorus is actually in that soil already, how wet those soils are, how leachable they are, um, and then how close they would be to a water body. Phosphorus is obviously removed by plants. Um, uh, they would be removed by things like corn, but when, when you try and add dairy manure and poultry litter to meet the nitrogen requirements, remember nitrogen leaches out, you'll end up with a heck of a lot more phosphorus over, over time. So in these animal concentrated animal feeding operations, when they apply the manure, the nitrogen leaches out immediately, the phosphorus sticks and then begins to accumulate over time. Eventually that also begins to <coughs> leach out into the environment and cause eutrophication problems, in this, in this case often to fresh water bodies. The phosphorus cycle is a little bit more different. Uh, let's start with, remember, nitrogen starts in the atmosphere. Phosphorus is a mineral-based uh, nutrient that starts really in the soils itself. Now this is, uh, let's look at the water column over here. Uh, we can also talk about not only the water column, this is sort of adapted to um, uh, an aquatic sciences part. But phosphorus can also be taken up into growing plants, okay? But in the same way, many of the um, microbes in the soil are aquatic. So phosphorus is taken up. They need phosphorus for energy. If you remember, the, uh, the uh, Krebs cycle makes use of ATP and ADP. So phosphorus gets cycled around. Adenosine triphosphate and adenosine diphosphate. Uh, if we don't have phosphorus in our system, we can't make those things, those little mitochondria in our cell bodies work. So phosphorus is very much essential for that. So phos phosphorus is taken up into plant cyto cytoplasm, also bacterial and uh, microbial cytoplasm. So microbes would be bacteria, fungi, nematodes, um, uh, and protozoans, as well as... Um, what are the other guys' names? Uh, we'll get to that later on. But it's taken up into the plant cytoplasm. When those, when those um, organisms die or are consumed by other plants, they end up as dead and particulate uh, uh, parts of uh, phosphorus. So as a part of, you know, a dead plant uh, um, that's lying on the ground. A lot of that is phosphor phosphorus. It would decay and become phos phosphate or some form of phosphate ion, which could either then be absorbed back into the plants or into the microbes, or it would actually go down uh, and end up uh, as part of the sediments or actually glommed on to the soil itself, or um, uh, so that's one of the one of the processes that would happen. Um, in this case, you're also looking at a water column. Phosphor phosphorus would also end up in soil sediments and kind of get glommed onto that. The equivalent in the soils, it would end up kind of being absorbed onto those soil uh, soil particles. Once these sediments or soil particles get really, really um, uh, <coughs> saturated, they then actually release phosphates back into the soil, which can be taken up, but uh, can also then be released back into the environment. Now, um, when we have phosphorus, um, for instance, 
in things like uh, from soil erosion, it's mainly in the form of sediments. About 90% is particulate phosphorus and only about 10% is actually in the form of phosphate. So natural phosphorus tends to occur in very, very low proportions of dissolved phosphorus and very, very high proportions of phosphorus that's particulate, i.e. it's tied either to an organic particle or it's tied to a mineral particle or both. Now in, the, in sewage or, you know, urine of animals or urine of humans, uh, you would find the ratio kind of flipped where you'd have the majority of your phosphorus is actually soluble uh, or in the form of SRPs, soluble reactive phosphorus, and only about 10% would be particulate. Uh, when that's the case, you know, you're probably going to have an excess of phosphorus in your water, which then would go uh, be responsible for eutrophication in water bodies that are phosphorus limiting Typically, that's going to be in a freshwater lake, uh, lake system. Potassium, uh, it, it's big. Uh, it's known for imparting disease resistance. It's a big when you have, uh, uh, when your, your plant begins to fruit. Uh, so you really want it around when, when that plant begins to fruit and it's making those sugars and oils. Um, you need a lot of p potassium around, uh, and when you don't have enough potassium, you're going to have some of this leaf curling or yellowing. You can see some of those symptoms. Again, I, I'm not too worried about that. I'm more worried about kind of what happens. Interestingly enough, um, potassium is also going to get leached out, but there are no known environmental... Um, problems with excesses of potassium, but in farming systems, if only say 40% of your potassium ends up in the plant, uh, it means that your farm is spending too much on potassium. The, the fertilizer company is not going to mind because they're selling the farmer more potassium, which is great for them, but uh, you just don't want to have excess potassium if for no, no other reason than economic reason. Your micronutrients, uh, these are here because the plant uses them in small amounts. We'll look at those uh, on one of the soil tests and see what it is. Uh, micronutrient recommendations are a lot more um, qualitative than macronutrient recommendations. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that as well. So factors that affect micronutrient availability, very much like pH as well. Um, pH affects all the macronutrients, and if you go to previous slides, you will see that uh, nutrients are affected, nutrient uptakes are affected by pH. But you can see at low pHs, molybdenum would become a problem, yet iron would not be a problem. Iron would become more and more soluble, okay? Boron would be a problem at low pHs, and then pHs between sort of 7.5 and, and 8.5. Interestingly enough, it becomes less of a problem here. You do not want soils at pHs, those really, really sodic soils at that, uh, at that level. Uh, manganese also has this two-tailed thing. So in most of these cases, your optimum soil pH is going to be somewhere around about 6.5 to a pH of 7, and you'll have enough. Um, but it, it, you can see, for instance, in some cases, that if your pH is too low or too high, one or other nutrient will not be absorbed into that plant, even if you might have very, very high concentrations of that nutrient in the soil. Um, when we talk about lining of soils, <clears throat> we are talking typically of soils that are in annual agricultural systems and where 
the nitrogen fertilizer in the form of ammonium uh, or ammonia is applied on an annual basis or on a regular basis. Those hydrogen ions in the ammonia leach down into the soils, uh, concentrate uh, their very high concentrations of these ammonia ions because basically what happens is the nitrifying bacteria get onto the ammonia ions, they replace the hydrogen with oxygen, that ammonia then becomes a nitrogen, the hydrogen ions are free and eventually they begin to replace the calcium and magnesium. The calcium and magnesium then get leached out into lower soil horizons, into that, uh, from the E horizon into the B and the C horizons and eventually completely out of that soil profile. Well, uh, what do farmers do about it? They will lime, uh, they will increase the P pH and try and get that optimum pH between six and a half and seven. Um, that'll also in increase the uh, calcium content and reduce aluminum and magnesium toxicity. Um, there is also the element that they can enhance nitrogen fixation because if your soil pH is too low, it's going to suppress the growth of that uh, bacterium, the uh, rhizobia bacterium. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about the herbicide activity, but <laughs> farmers use herbicides to burn down old crops, especially in no-till systems. So the lining materials uh, typically are going to be calcite or dolomite. Dolomite has the added advantage in the, the sense that you bring both calcium and magnesium uh, to, the, to the table. Um, uh, you know, you can bring uh, natural systems, you can bring wood ash or seashells or uh, hydrated lime which would be calcium uh, hydroxide or that slate lime calcium oxide. So there are many forms uh, but you know the ag lime or the crushed limestone is going to be the most prevalent. Your limering reaction, you've got a clay particle and this is kind of the reverse of what happens when your soils acidify. Your calcium carbonate reacts with the clay particle. It Now the equilibrium changes. The calcium adheres to the clay particle um, and uh, your the um, calcium carbonate then reacts uh, with the um, extra hydrogen ion and forms water and then uh, if you've got aluminum around it forms aluminum hydroxide and carbon dioxide so um, then you know your equilibrium or your pH is restored in that way um, I'm not going to worry too much about that. Uh, so we've talked about acidifying soils. Uh, this is just kind of gardening information, which is, that's okay. Let's carry on to soil fertility recommendations. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, when you send a soil sample to any land-grant university, every um, state has a land-grant university in South Carolina. Our land grant university is Clemson, and they have an, a, an agricultural laboratory uh, that will look at your soils, and then based on the quantity of material in your soils, and often based on your soil type, they will come back to you with a recommendation of how, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, sorry, uh, yeah, and then also... Uh, micronutrients to add. The micronutrient addition is is often in the form of comments rather than hard and fast numbers. Okay, so um, typically a soil fertility analysis from Clemson will include pH, buffer pH, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper, manganese, boron, sodium, the amount of organic matter, this is a very, very high organic matter concentration. 10% is very high. Typically, that number is going to be between 1 or maybe even half and 2%. Cation exchange capacity, again, very, very high because of the high organic matter concentrations. Uh, in a normal agricultural soil uh, in South Carolina, that CEC is going to be 
much closer to about two or, or four. Um, and then there's your percent base saturation over here. Okay. Again, these base saturations are a little bit more higher than some of the natural soils we find in, in this part of the world. So soil fertility is really the study of supplying um, artificial nutrients to the soil. M most of the premises of soil fertility, when we think about applying commercial fertilizer, are based on commercially tilled soils or commercial tilled soils. That paradigm is now beginning to change, but most of these premises are based on those commercially farmed agricultural soils. <coughs> uh, you've got the nutrient analysis, and they talk about nutrients becoming available through organic matter decomposition, which is highly relevant, but when you've only got, say, one or half or one percent of organic matter in your soil, that becomes irre irrelevant. Chemical weathering of minerals, yes, it's there. Airborne additions, yes, it's there. There's a little bit of nitrogen that comes in from nitrates in uh, rainfall, for instance, and then fertilizers. F in commercial ag systems, fertilizers are the primary um, are the primary way in which farmers uh, grow their crops. There was a fellow in about the 1840s by the name of Justus von Liebig, and he basically took plants and put them in artificial soils. These soils were essentially devoid of organic matter or had very little organic matter. And basically he began to, uh, what he did was he raised and lowered the levels of, increased and decreased the levels of some of the plant nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And then he also increased and reduced the amount of light and heat and water and things like that. And what he discovered was this whole idea of the law of the minimum, is that whatever nutrient or plant growth factor was there in the least amount, despite the abundance of other gro plant growth factors, that growth factor then would limit that plant's growth. And typically we apply Liebig's law of the minimum to our uh, plant macronutrients or when we look at soil fertilizer recommendations. So for instance, if, plant fo uh, if soil phosphorus in a commercially farmed soil is um, <coughs> very, very low, much lower than other factors, it uh, doesn't matter how much your nitrogen and potassium and other micronutrients are there, the plant will be limited by the low amount of phosphorus. So we can apply all of these others till the cow comes home. Your plant's growth is going to be limited by phosphorus. Conversely, if all of the other nutrients are well in abundance, uh, and you've got a low amount of nitrogen in your soil, the plant's growth will be limited by nitrogen. But the same can be said for things like water. You know, you can have all the fertil fertilizers in the world. If it doesn't rain or if you don't get water onto that crop, your crop's going to be in a lot of trouble as well. So you can see uh, this applies not only to macro and micronutrients or macronutrients especially, but it also applies to things like light, heat, um, and then of course water itself, soil water or soil moisture. So soil testing really, so what you do is you go get a soil auger and you can see that this soil auger has a, um, a hollow point. This is uh, I think half, a half inch in diameter. You stick it in, into the ground. This has got a, a step on it. You'll stick it into the ground and uh, take out your sample and for every acre you may want to take a composite of you know maybe 20 to 30 samples you know um, you really want a representative sample you'd put it in this bowl over here that you can see here and then often uh, your samples uh, your land-grant university would supply you with a sample bag you you take that composite 
you may have to, you want to mix it up. There might be a lot more sample than you can send. Uh, so you'd mix it up and you'd send um, the right amount to the, to, to the lab and then you'd discard the rest. So uh, one sample uh, or just one sample core will not do it. You really want representative samples. So you can see, you can automate this whole process. A lot of people with precision agriculture will actually sample on a grid and that will help them to know uh, uh, how, where to apply more nitrogen, where to, or not nitrogen, phosphorus, where to apply more lime and they can sort of program that into their uh, the applicators. Um, so how is soil fertility determined or uh, how, do, how do the researchers know how to do that? Well they use um, this whole, well we use soil testing to predict fertilizer needs but um, how do they do it? Well they start typically uh, based on greenhouse and field research. Um, almost invariably Historically, this has been based on conventionally tilled fields. Conventionally tilled fields are fields that have very, very little soil organic matter. So that soil literally is a, a, almost an inorganic medium to grow plants in. Uh, that's a very dangerous conceptual way of looking at soils, but fact of the matter is that's what most of our commercially farmed soils look like. Um, so what they do is they, they would correlate and calibrate some of these numbers. Uh, they would use, uh, they would take soil tests and monitor yields. Um, and then basically, uh, based on how much so, uh, um, of a particular nutrient in the soil, they would say, okay, well, you only need to add so much. So they're giving a credit to that soil for its ability to provide that nutrient to the plant. In other words, every time you go out and plant, say, corn, which might need, uh, you know, which might need conventionally 120 pounds of nitrogen, 100 pounds of phosphorus, and 150 pounds of potassium uh, every, every year, well, you might have already 100 pounds of potassium in the soil, so you'd only apply 50 pounds of potassium. How's that look? Well, let's have a look at the correlation method first. What you see is that you have something called a yield response curve. So if we keep all other, this is sort of what Liebig did. If, if you keep all other nutrients and other growth factors the same and vary one, let's suppose this is phosphorus, you will see that... Um, at low soil test levels of phosphorus and all the other soil test levels will be adequate, you would find below optimum yields. But as you increase that soil test level of phosphorus, you will find that there is a dose response curve to that increase in soil test. But you will reach a point where that dose response actually levels off and as you increase your soil test phosphorus there is no more increase in yield um, and that's a that's a very well established principle and so um, you can see these guys the addition of phosphorus or whatever mineral this would be below optimum because there would still be a possibility of a yield increase if you add less than that. They want, uh, the optimum is where you've decreased the likelihood of any response to close to zero. Uh, and the reason is uh, farmers are always running off looking for yields because often that's the value of the crop. Uh, they're leaving more on the table if they leave yields out in the field rather than save a little bit on fertilizers. Typically that happens when crop Values are high when corn is at, you know, seven seven dollars seven dollars a bushel. Okay, so the process is, we've already done that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as the soil nutrient is extracted from the soil um, through acidification, or they put the 
uh, depends what nutrient it is. Phosphorus, for instance, is extracted with a little bit of acid. They might acidify that and use a um, use something an instrument like an ICP to see how much of those nutrients are there. Um, so you can see that. Now um, they also take in a, into account soils. Uh, you'll see Clemson does that uh, in their fertil fertilizer rec recommendation. So they do these exploratory fertilizer trials, but ultimately they do field trials uh, with selected soils. And um, here again we look at phosphorus. And so you're basically looking at the data and you're getting to up to a point where, for instance, the Bray phosphorus in PPM or parts per million, typically um, uh, 20 parts per million, you can multiply it by 2 to get 40 pounds per acre, which would be, you can calculate it out as pounds per acre in the top 6 inches of your soil. And that's kind of the rule of thumb we use, converting from PPM to pounds per acre. But your empirical data shows that at very low phosphorus concentrations, your yield relative, say, to the optimum yield of 100% is kind of down there. As you increase your phosphorus, you see this uh, significant dose response uh, that you get here, this dose response curve. And then that response begins to level off over here. You know, you've got a little bit of noise, but by and large, you you don't have any response to an increased amount of phosphorus. If you add more phosphorus here, basically what you're doing is you're wasting money. So your optimal phosphorus um, addition would probably be, well, you'd want to add so that you've got an optimum, or your optimum soil phosphorus level is going to be in this area according to an ag agronomic recommendation. So... This is called the Kate Nelson method, um, and we've kind of discussed that. You can read the, the, t the, the text there as well. So soil test categories, again, you'll be able to see this uh, in the, uh, the Clemson soil test category, and I'll put that out there for you on, on Blackboard as well. But um, when you've got very low weathered soil test phosphorus or potassium, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. But when you've got very low, you are, you are almost assured of a response if you were to add that particular nutrient, be it phosphorus or potassium. Low, medium, high. When you've got very high soil test nutrients uh, in that soil, again, if it's phosphorus or, or potassium, it's uh, the chances of a response, in other words, a response in terms of an increase in yield, will be much lower. So when you've got very high phosphorus or, or potassium concentrations, all other nutrients being equal, that response, the chance of that response will be very high. <clears throat> now, there's one nutrient in your soil test package that is not measured, um, and that's nitrogen. And the reason why nitrogen is not measured, uh, number one is there are so many different forms of nitrogen in the soil. Organic nitrogen, it's in the form of nitrate, it's in the form of uh, ammonium, it's also in the form of uh, water extractable organic nit nitrogen, uh, all of those forms. But the fact is that if I had to take a sample and send it off to Clemson, um, in two or three days, my nitrogen situation in the soil, especially my nitrates, may be very different, especially if I had some kind of rain event, or if it got colder, or if it got warmer. So nitrogen is very, very volatile, and what often happens in the soil test recommendations, they usually give you a recommendation in terms of N, P, and K, they usually keep their nitrogen recommendations constant. So corn, and that might be based on, say, um, yield. So 100 bushel per acre corn, typically you'd want to apply 100 pounds of nitrogen, regardless of what that soil looks like. Uh, we'll get to that later. One of the things that Clemson does, just sort of as a final thing, 
is after a corn, a, a soybean crop, they will give you a 40 pound per acre nitrogen credit. In other words, let's suppose your original recommendation, say for 100 bushel per acre corn, is 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen. If you grew soybeans in the last season, uh, you would then save on your nitrogen if you wanted to by only applying 60 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Lots of farmers say, oh, I'm not going to take that credit, I'm just going to make safe, play safe and add that 100 pounds per acre. So they often would add more nitrogen just to be assured of that yield. Uh, we won't get into the economics of that at this stage. So let's review. We've looked at soil pH, we've, which influences profoundly soil fertility. Remember, it has an influence of, on both macronutrients and micronutrients. pH is too high, might affect some. pH is too low, might affect others. Cation exchange capacity is extremely important for potassium, calcium, magnesium those basic cations and then we just kind of ran through this whole notion of soil fertility um, these are based on commercial applications where organic systems are not taken into account that's beginning to change now but I foresee that in the next 10 to 15 years people will still look at soil fertility in this way and that would be essential for you guys to look at that in class, what I'm going to do is uh, we will go through some of those soil fertility calculations uh, so that you understand those things as well. So I hope this has been useful, um, and we will see you in class soon. Thank you very much.